summer solstice and i'm the living queen our message is this that this is the beginning of summer solstice and we're all here today to groove and have a beautiful time together and that it's only the beginning june 21st marks the beginning and it will continue as long as people can get together and love each other and share things together and listen to music and have a beautiful time Chicago to get away from whatever that was there. One of the reasons I started this in the first place was because my parents were both very neurotic. And I realized this because I went to a psychiatrist for nine years. And uh, at the later stages of analysis, I realized just how neurotic and, and ill and 
in, in a world of illusion, my parents were, and I decided that I was going to be the one in my, gen in my family to stop it. It was going to stop with my generation, that I refused to pass this on to my children. What's happening here is like uh, every city, in the, particularly on this day, every city in the nation is seeing the sun at its zenith. And it's the first, you might say, the first hippie national holiday, self declared holiday. A digger is a person that they label, uh, what you call it, beatnik, you dig? Beatnik, people with uh, unconventional generation. They didn't know what was happening. They didn't know the beatnik cared so much about humanity as they do now. You know what I mean? Well, a free store to me, the free store to me means a great deal because it helps out the community and it brings people together with no profit involved. If there was any profit involved, I wouldn't be here because money doesn't mean that much to me. You know what I mean? You talk about the hippie? What is the hippie? Where did the name come from, hippie? Why don't you talk about the younger generation, the people who are changing? Why don't you talk about the people who know what's happening and don't agree with the old line of thinking? Why don't you talk about the people who believe in brotherly love and nothing else and prove it every day on Hate Ashbury? My name is today Louise Malone, age 20, height 5'3", weight 110, eyes blue, hair blonde, education, graduated from Judson School, Scottsdale, Arizona, one semester University of Arizona, one semester Eastern New Mexico University, six months secretarial school, other training, Nancy Taylor modeling course, one year judo, taught self-defense at the University of Arizona experience. Two years of dramatics, San Carlos High, San Carlos, California. One year drama club, Roswell High. One year theater group, Judson School. Plays, bells are ringing, Wizard of Oz, No Time for Sergeants, etc. Also worked on and managed crews. Helped write and produce plays at Judson School. Various school skits, etc. Hobbies. Reading, judo, music, dope, hate Ashbury, sewing, cooking, collecting fairy tale books. Job experience, sold Berkeley Barbs, typed at co-op, sold dope, worked as a legal secretary last summer. Plans, to gain knowledge in any way possible, find out what my true interest is and throw myself into it for a while, and finally marry after I've traveled a bit. One of the first questions that they'll ask is, what do you do? And so I say, I live. And they say, no, I mean, do you work or what? And I say, no, I just live. And they say, well, you must do something because their whole orientation is towards job, occupation. This is their whole life. Money. Money and status. You tell them that you don't do anything and that you come to the park and it's... It's like they can't believe you, and they want to believe you so very much, and they look in your eyes, and they can see that you believe what you're saying, and you're telling them the truth. And they know that they can't make it, that they're 45 years old, and they're all hung up in the mortgage payments, and paying off the car, and wives and kids, and just endless circles of involvement. A lot of people say to me, what are you doing? You're not doing any work. You're not working at a job and making a big salary, but... 
we're doing the hardest work in the world because we're growing, we're trying to change. And that's a lot harder than staying in the same rut and going along year after year doing the same thing and thinking the same things and living the exact same way. I like living here because I get to do exactly what I want when I want. Like, if I want to run down the street and turn cartwheels, I do that. If I want to climb a tree, I do that. And if I want to freak out tourists, I do that. And it's completely free. You have all these young kids coming from a very rich, affluent, middle-class society where they've been taken care of since they've been babies and never really had to do anything no. for themselves uh, in a serious... Um, way and now they come here and they want to be hippies and they still want to be taken care of. The kids that are coming here are also the most adventuresome of the lot of this generation. They want to strike out on their own. They want to see about life. They're very hungry for life and not a plasticized, fantasized version that comes through their school and the suburban life which uh, is not very fulfilling to much of the human spirit. A kid often uh, hits a commune, uh, finds a place to live, coasts for a couple of days, uh, and then uh, catches on to the fact that uh, it doesn't take very much, but it does take some effort to keep the thing going, to keep all his friends and himself alive. People are pouring into the scene so fast that it's very difficult to turn them all on because what you're trying to turn them on to is freedom. That if everyone is free, if everyone really has the room to do their thing, something really fine will come out of it. But in learning how to do your thing, you make mistakes. You can really just fuck everything up. And this, this is the danger of, you know, like 100,000 people coming to San Francisco this summer. You know, maybe there'll be street riots, you know, which is not good. Maybe we'll have that sort of problem. The other problem is that we're getting successful enough now that we're going to have to integrate back into society. The music is the best example. We're all making a lot of money. Like Donovan said, beatniks getting rich. Well, the rock bands in the San Francisco area are going to make more than a million dollars this year. And this brings a lot of problems with it, because we're rapidly moving up into the entire establishment, and it's a question of whether we're going to turn them on or they're going to turn us off.
was in a ridiculous excuse for a bust in Roswell, New Mexico, just before I left to come out here. And there were about ten guys in Roswell, the local freaks, that got together and rented a house. And um, we were all over there one night, uh, and the police had been watching all of us because we were the only weird people in the town, and we were kind of easy to spot, I guess. And they'd been watching the house constantly. And round about midnight, five of us were in one bedroom, jumping up and down in a bed, stoned. And about ten kids were downstairs listening to music and running around. And twenty policemen walked through the door into the living room. And uh, we asked what they were there for, and they said, just shut up and sit down, we're searching your house. And we asked them if they had a search warrant, and they said, shut up and sit down, we're searching your house. And so they were frisking everyone and running around, and half of the policemen were just standing around not knowing what to do, and they were yawning because they were gotten up so late. And it was supposed to be very big and exciting because all of the towns around had been besting people, Albuquerque had been besting people, and I guess the police wanted to get into the newspapers in Roswell. But it sure made me realize that I had to get out of there and come to a place like this. I am like a stranger. young people from uh, upper middle class families 
who have moved into a physical environment that is in effect a reversion from the kind of environment in which they live to one that uh, goes back, let's say, three or four generations. They're living in gross insanitary conditions uh, with a great deal of overcrowding. There is a very high incidence of infectious hepatitis. By reason of their use of drugs and the using of uh, unsterile needles, about one-fourth or one-fifth of our total caseload in the venereal disease clinics appear to be hippies. Now, I'm going on the appearance solely. And uh, we have one case history in which uh, a young chap has been into the clinic 12 times in three months with 12 different cases of gonorrhea. Well, what the kids are really here for is uh, pretty difficult for me to, uh, to evaluate. They're given a sense of values by their parents and by society generally, and uh, they find out that none of us live quite up to that, those values. So I think one of the things that they're here for is to find out some kind of a satisfaction of a personal philosophy as to just exactly why they are here, why they are here on Earth, so to speak. Uh, most of us uh, have gone through this process and uh, find it by a process of trial and error. The only thing that I think bothers me is that their trial and error has to be associated so often with mind-altering drugs of various kinds, beginning, of course, with, with pot. Barb, they're soaked in LSD. You roll them up and smoke them and they'll get you high. They're 20 cents. Thank you. You know, if you roll down your window, nobody will jump in and get you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm going to repent of my sins and make my peace with God. How do you know? God may cut you off. God may cut some of you off. If you're not here doing some good in this world, if you're not out here serving a few if you're not out here making use of your strength, of your talents, of your abilities, of the life, of your youth that God has given you, my friend, God can cut you off one of these days. That's right. Invite him to take away your sins. Invite him to set you free. He that the Son of God sets free is free indeed. You can be free. You can find peace. It's 20 cents. Here. Thank you. Would you like to buy a little book on how to roll a perfect joint? The Hip Job Co-op uh, is a name that really doesn't describe what this thing is all about. It functions along with the diggers and the free medical clinic and the Krishna temple and various other shops and institutions in the hate like the Love Vortex, the Orifice. All of these uh, organizations cover different aspects of the community doing their thing. The Job Co-op has, has just recently put in an altar as of yesterday. We think that this probably expresses where most, where most of our heads are going. We're still continuing to uh, s supply information to people. We're trying to uh, turn on the world, man. That's what we're doing. We're turning on people. We're being turned on. It's one and the same.
reason why I fall in with the scene and feel that I belong is because all the things that these people here believe in are the same things that I believe in, and, and love and beautiful things, natural things, and um, they all have one basic rule, do not unto others as you would not have them do unto you. So I still can't understand why so many people out there keep pointing the finger and saying, you people are wrong, you people are wrong, you people are wrong, or we're giving you the love, we're giving you the love, where the people don't realize that before you can spread love around anybody else, you've first got to find it in yourself. I feel now that I've found love in myself, I've found myself and what I should do, and uh, I feel I can, I can help do things for the younger people. I, I mean, I'm not much with words, but just by being myself, I'm doing my part. My husband thinks I'm very narrow-minded, and some people I probably am, but my opinion of them is that some of their viewpoints are all right, but as a whole, I think that they're dirty, and I don't think that they have to, I don't think that they have to live this way in order to do the things that they want. I think they ought to have certain standards that they should live up to, and I think this is important in our society. I, I have friends who have taken LSD, and they're rather evangelistic about it. Sounds like something I would like to do. If I had a 15-year-old daughter, I guess I would want to be more sure than I am now that, you know, before she took it, it, it would be all right. Well, yeah, because there are so many other things that characterize the hippies, like the love of colors and, and form and, and an aesthetic sensitivity that hasn't been part of any other youthful rebellion. I just feel that they're young, growing children trying to express themselves, trying to learn who they are, where they are, what their identity is, and I respect them. I have a few criticisms. When they will move into a community, for example, and say, take the facilities that the old state taxpayers have paid for and ask to use them gratis, then I say, uh, no. No. Then you have to grow up and pay for these facilities that you're asking to use. I wrote an article called Guerrilla Theater in which we talk about getting people from the community who are dropouts, who dislike the society, the old left, the new left, the psychedelic left, uh, junkies, ex-junkies, winos, uh, dropouts, psychotics, uh, people who are really disenchanted with what happens. They join us. They help us do shows. There's a whole non-commercial underground across the country. Not underground. I mean, everybody profits off the underground at this point. It's very open. Because this is like a middle-class country. But the dropouts, the hippies, and the ex-beatniks, and the professional dropouts, that is, we work hard. We're professional dropouts, dropouts from middle class ideology, success ideology. We not only criticize it, but we live it. We do it. Different than you who watch and understand the hippie scene, who understand the avant-garde. The difference is the avant-garde does it. The new person is not one who simply says it's a bad society, but proves it by his actions. It's a great difference. Great difference from a critic of the society, which are the liberals' critics like Noam Chomsky and other people who make films, etc. Criticize the society, but don't do it. The difference is we do it. We live it all the time. We'll continue living it. We survive. We work hard. We also eat less than most other people. We demand less. We don't spend $1,500 on furniture. We don't buy a stage for uh, $3,000. We pay about $500 for it. Pay our actors $5 a performance. You can live on $25 a week. That's assuming you're doing something you're interested in and something that's valuable. If you're not doing anything that's interesting, then you got to get a lot of money, Mac. you got to make a fortune to keep a boring job or to, or to support a war in Vietnam that's evil, that's murderous. So we struggle in our own humble way to destroy the United States. <laughs> My name was originally Louise Stoddard Malone, and I'm having it legally changed to today Louise Malone. The name came about when I was sitting in the drugstore cafe, and a girl named Monday, who I had never met, smiled, and we started talking, and she gave me some Osley acid, and we started talking to another guy, Don, and we gave him some acid, and we started running around, and we decided that we didn't like my name, and we wanted to change it. We thought today was a very beautiful word, 
had the essence of what everything was about. Like now, everything is now, everything is today. And so I've been going by that name ever since. We don't care how the country looks. We don't care about reading books. We don't care about the way he walked. We don't care about the way he talked. We don't know what's up or down. Is he when a smile or frown? He's strong. He don't care. on top of STP, on top of second all, on top of grass, and on top of everything. Like there is nothing that I haven't tried. I love it all. And all the bad trips are in your mind. Like these people, like this, this girl that, that was freaked out here. It's, it's all in her mind. She must be worried about something. So she has a guilty conscience, but don't feel guilty. Be happy. Always be happy. That's, that's the most important thing. Always be happy. Because you can be happy. You can be happy. Dead stone. Dead stone. LSD is something that here at the hospital began to really come to our notice a year or so ago when a number of individuals maybe once in a while would come in brought by their friends or police occasionally when they were alone panicked uh, frightened disoriented confused and sometimes having any of the entire gamut of psychiatric symptoms paranoid fears that they were being persecuted and were being killed uh, hysterical symptoms, physical symptoms, quite a range. And the drug was clearly part of a whole experiment by a lot of youth seeking out new and alternative styles of life. The uh, combination of the energy and enthusiasm, the risks that the kids would take, the attempt to find new ways, the colorfulness, uh, the kindliness, the searching for new directions and new experiences in themselves I always saw as um, something that we depended on youth for. The music, the art, the experiments, the, the way of life that they were trying to find seemed to have a potential for a lot of value that at the same time the uh, danger, the pain, the pain was terrible that some of the kids could be having on their trips. Home Free is a sanctuary that is starting up in conjunction with the medical clinic here. Unfortunately, this is an anxiety-ridden society, and many times with LSD, it magnifies, gives them a microcosm of their anxiety, and they have a tough time walking through the screen and understanding these anxieties. And they need a place just to come and sit down, someone to talk to, where they can relax and talk it out and not be shot down chemically with Thorazine or other strong tranquilizers, or stuck in an institution or a hospital with its bare white walls while they're high under a strong dose of LSD will just louse them up for months. This is one way in which the community is trying to answer this problem. We found that many people who, uh, mostly city people, who got stuck on hard drugs for one reason or another, uh, because of the way they are and because of the way society is, they got stuck on heroin or methadrine or uh, opium and whatnot. Uh, once they have the psychedelic experience, they tend to keep away from those drugs and uh, cure themselves of it and work towards a far more pure system of life and a far, far purer drugs, organic drugs, peyote, mescaline, marijuana, LSD, uh, are far different than hard drugs and opiates. They don't dull you, they increase your awareness. It's very hard to communicate in an LSD world if you haven't tried it. I haven't tried it. I suppose I've been scared off by what I've read in the mass uh, media. I have no particular interest in trying it. Uh, I have smoked pot since I was a kid on the police beat. I was first turned on by a police officer, a sergeant uh, who was head of the narcotics detail. I went on a raid with him when I was 17 years old. We picked up a lot of pot. 
heroin. It was a big arrest. And uh, we picked up the cigarettes and said, well, kid, you're going to try this sooner or later. You better try it under good auspices. You better try it with a cop. So we both lit up, the sergeant and I. And that was my first uh, try. I found it pleasant, uh, not particularly exciting. Maybe because I was surrounded by the fuzz while I was smoking it. I've taken acid about 23 times, and it has changed me, I think, for the best, in that it's made me more perceptive, more sensitive to the world around me, to people, to colors, to just beauty. And when I'm on an acid trip, everything is more intensified. I'll see wild, moving, uh, colorful patterns and uh, I am much more sensitive to the colors that make up colors. And everything seems very much alive, very much full of energy and very, very beautiful. You stay in an energy, so you dive in the stream and you get your energy and you fill your body with energy, you fill your, your consciousness with energy. If you keep in, keep into that stream, you'll have to depolarize yourself. So you take what you've gotten, it's like between acid, you don't pop acid every weekend. And if you do, you're not getting out of it what you might if you popped it once a month, once every six months, which is another kind of consciousness. Well, here it is, folks, that terrible drug LSD.
people are very interested in Eastern philosophy, perhaps because they're unsatisfied with uh, their own philosophy or religion. And uh, the items that we provide in the store uh, help to encourage that kind of thing. And also help to uh, stimulate our deep consciousness to the fact that these things are here. They've been here for years for thousands of years and now we can enjoy them. We can get hung up looking at them and tripping out into fantasy about them and use them to decorate our own places. And in this condition we could then, you know, say, wow, look what look what we've been missing. We haven't been shown these things. We can sit here and, and look at Tibetan calendars or to door decorations or to lamps and feel how old they are and their uses and to be functional with them, and then to look out, look out out of yourself, and then back into yourself, and maybe find an answer for something. No one could find every answer. The uptight culture has defined God and put him in a box. So when we do something as clergymen in terms of the uptight culture or in terms of the youth culture, the chief of police comes and shakes his finger at me and says, if you don't protect God's law, we will. And they mean it, buddy. They've got guns, and they're busting people, and they're busting the humans in San Francisco, and they, they think that they are the spokesman for an uptight world's God. Well, you see, one of the uh, important things is uh, why I'm not uh, uptight with the new community is because uh, they got soul, you see. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and you see, we know there's a commonness among us. Yeah, yeah, we, really we, know exactly. what, we know what we go through, don't we? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> Therefore, you know, I don't have to be uptight, and they don't have to be uptight because we understand each other. No, but listen, and we act. We, wait just a minute, baby. Wait a minute. Part of the thing is also, you know, I've had my mind blown a long time, but in a different way. You see? Yeah. And then all of a sudden there comes a community along who says, look, baby, I'm going to identify with you. Yeah. I'm going to be with you. Right. Yeah, you know, I'm going to starve with great. you. <laughs> and I'm going to live in poverty with yeah. you. <laughs> you know? And I'm going to suffer at the billy, at, 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 at the, at the, at the, at the uh, clunks of the billy club, you know? And I'm going to be it's with you. Thing, now, all of a sudden, all, and you know, the most important thing, all this brotherhood jazz we've been talking about in church, all of a sudden, it's here, you know, it's here. Yeah. It's like now. Man, I was yeah. praying with you, Cash. You were praying on my yeah. head. <laughs> I have a real hip feeling for the hippies, and let me tell you this, because I can compare myself in four areas, and if I started to uh, describe myself in these four areas, and I asked the question, well, what am I or who am I like, the answer would be a real hippie girl. Let me put it this way. There are four things that the hippies do that I do. First of all, many of them change their names. True? Yes. Many of them change their names. I have done that. I have changed my name. Uh, in the second place, they change their uh, conventional garb. I share that experience with them, too, because the kind of clothing that I wear is a statement to the rest of the world that I don't think this is the most important thing in life, that there are other things that are more important and that they can perhaps be done in a particular kind of dress. In other words, when I go abroad in my religious habit, I'm saying something just as you hippie girls, when you go abroad, you're saying something too in your conventional clothing. Uh, many uh, hippies, most of them I'm sure, are looking for some kind of communal living. They want that sense of community. I have that in, in my religious family. 
We, we all love each other so much. We have a house. We have a we have a home. Some place that, that we run down the hall and sweep all the time. And we mop the floors and we keep it neat and we wash the windows. We make our beds. It's a home. Christmas time, we'll get a Christmas tree and put it in the living room. It's a whole bunch of people all living together. But they aren't concerned with themselves and they're concerned with other people. And all they want to do is to just give to other people. Whether it's materially, whether it's mentally, no matter what it is, they just want to give. We're just sitting around joking about one night and by the we end of the evening we uh, decided to start a rock and roll band. We started, when we started off playing, we didn't all live together. And then eventually we decided we had to live together. And we like the more we lived together, the less fights we had. Which is the place that has the name of the Indians that Maya has. Mm. Maya also means illusion. Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> we grabbed her off the street and recruited her. <clears throat> it's not true. I grabbed you guys off the street. <laughs> I don't think she'll ever go. <laughs> You're I haven't seen her go to college. No, she, uh, she'll, she's getting awfully hung up now around here. <laughs> She's dropped out so far, she'll never come back. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. I wasn't speaking about this precise moment. <laughs> okay. Just get you a dog. I owe you money. <laughs> I think the hippies should be should be allowed to live the way they want to live. Well, you know, they're people. Are they so different than you and I, really? Well, you know, it makes no difference whether they're different Steve, or not. had I the means and had I not the you, ties you, you would, that I do... You and I would be hippies, right? Listen, I would, you know, <laughs> but, but Eli, I'd wear those clothes. They're clean people. They're up. They're up. The well, v they're, they're down. They're, they're doing what they want to do. They're, they're, they're living the way they want to live, and we should leave them alone. We, you, you and I couldn't be hippies, Eli. I couldn't, uh, I I I couldn't take off my, my... I could be... I'm a hippie in my heart. But you're not you know? a hippie, Eli. I am right because now. I love people, you know. I love my neighbor more than myself, and that's their whole well, philosophy. I, I agree with you. They're, they're philosophy. You know, they, they, they love. It's they, Christian. They're against, they're it's so they, Christian. It's they share. It's, it's beautiful, but you and I can't live that way. You, you can't take off your, your dress. You know why we your, can't live that earrings. way? Because why? we've had our college education. We have mother and father back home. Right, and we're used to we're used to the martinis at five o'clock every right. afternoon, and the the, the wine and, and the works. There are certain things that we have to do that society expects, expects of, us. of us, and we do it, but secretly. Yes, God damn it, we do you, it. If you had a choice, you and I would both be down there.
I've learned so much more from going to the drugstore cafe and just talking to people than I ever learned in college or high school because I think knowledge can be gained much more from contact with people than from books. And the drugstore is really a good place to do this. People just go in and, and order coffee and sit down and rap and talk to each other and learn. The problem is, though, now that they've started charging a 50-cent minimum after 6 o'clock in the afternoon. It is kind of a hassle because not, sometimes you don't have 50 cents, but it's just in keeping with the rest of Hate Street, which is getting so commercial anyway. But it's, it's one of the few nice places left that you can go and, and just see your friends. Handmade hippie dope vibes. Weird, weird. Too much, brother. Sure. I got some funny pipes here, man. Look at that one. Get a righteous toe pass. That's my favorite one, though, man. Oh. Sure. For love, bro. So big it takes at least two people to smoke it, man. Right. right. You. Get the righteous toe, too. Look at this one. I made that in the park yesterday. Sure. Weird pipes. Handmade dope pipes. I got a nice opium pipe. Sure, that's good for opium, man. Sure. Put a little screen in there. Have you any spare change, sir? No, sorry. Thank you. Do you have any spare change? Do I have any spare change? Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, I'm supporting a terrible strawberry ice cream habit, and I'm suffering with drugs. Short as a bitch. It's terrible, man. Don't know what to do. You have you any spare Let's change? Just ask you. Uh, <laughs> maybe we should make a team. <laughs> I'm gonna start selling my books or something. <laughs> Have you any spare change? Just got here for my last time. Have you any spare change? Oh, no, man. I'm just splitting town. <laughs> uh, have you any spare change? No, oh, sorry. I'm wiped out. Thank you. Have you any spare change? Sorry, I don't. Thank you. Wouldn't by any chance have any spare change? No, you? I don't. Thanks anyway. Spare change? Nope. Any spare change? <laughs> I'm addicted to Twinkies and you know candy bars through choice and I'm addicted to oatmeal through chance. Money is kind of a shortage and it seems lately we've been eating oatmeal for three meals a day. Mainly because it's easy and it's inexpensive and it's nourishing. But whenever I can get my hands on them, I love Hostess Twinkies and I love, you know, candy bars. But I just love them and I've been turning other people onto them and so I feel like a candy bar Twinkie pusher because I'm getting everyone strung out on them. Like, like you don't even, you don't even ask anybody's name anymore, you know. In this particular subculture, it doesn't matter what your name is. It might even matter more what your, what your uh, birth sign is than what your name is. <laughs> like I had this cat, I picked him up, he was hitchhiking, and he said, How do you do? My name is John. I'm born under the sign of cancer. And I introduced myself to him the same way. I think, I think that everybody here, after they've been here for a while, and they get... They get into the love feeling here. They want to, after they get their heads together, they sort of want to go home and turn their parents onto this 
this newfound sense of love because you realize like for the first time in your life you really truly deeply love your parents and they are yours they're your parents and you are their child and you belong to each other and you want to show them this beautiful thing that you found and you want to make them truly deeply happy what's happening is uh, a basic change in the evolutionary process of mankind that these these kids who you see here uh, and kids just like them in New York and Copenhagen and Tokyo and London and all over the world as a matter of fact um, are involved in, in something that only only monks cloistered in, in monasteries in Tibet were interested in up till oh, a very short time ago and that's consciousness expansion. Some people say that uh, the police are uh, acting as censors today, that they're dictating the morals of the people or attempting to dictate the morals of the people, and that actually they should be concerned with the hardcore criminal and the hardcore crime. You have to take into consideration that basic to many of the problems that we are confronted with today is a breakdown in moral and spiritual values. And uh, in this cynical day and age, uh, you're not supposed to talk about those things. Uh, you're antiquated and you belong to an age that's past when you do this. The Sexual Freedom League is an organization based on the philosophy that any sexual act between two consenting adults should be legal and that people should be uninhibited in their sexual expression. In San Francisco, our parties are limited to couples only. And the reason for this is there's still a double standard about men are free to do these things, but women may be criticized if they're sexually free. So if you had a party without couples only, you'd have all these single men showing up and freaking all the women out. So they limit the parties to couples only. However, you don't have to be a heterosexual couple. A homosexual couple, either male or female, is welcome at a party. The Sexual Freedom League is not necessarily for swingers. Because swingers are independent. Swingers organize their own parties with people that they know and people that they like. It's that personal contact that counts. Yeah, but swinging usually involves the group of people from three up to ten or a large party. mistaken with free sex and they really get hung up on the word free you know uh yeah it's 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 groovy and why not and of course you know but uh 
the slip, you know, when people start coming out of the street and they just, they just, they, they, they just see the, the chicks. They just, they, they just see the, you know, the chicks and they know it's free love. So they walk, so they walk down the street and, uh, hey baby, uh, let's go and practice some free love. You know, which is a bunch of garbage. You know, it's that's not even the idea. Here it seems like um, if someone wants to make love to someone and if they really care about them, but then they will, and it's not considered dirty. It's considered beautiful. Here, if you love somebody, and people here love everybody, if you want to make love to somebody, then you should. There's no reason why you shouldn't. Love here doesn't have to mean like uh, you plan to get married and, and you're going to love someone forever. Men here are much more like men, I think. They're, they're, they're not playing the games that they have to play in the straight world. They're not afraid to show emotion. They're not afraid to love beautiful things. Um, they're not afraid of being sissies by, you know, saying the way that they feel about things. They're much more exciting. Mm -hmm. Five years from now, I'll probably be a wife in the I don't think it's necessary to be a wife to be a mother. I don't think that people have to get married. I don't I don't think that getting married is always the best thing and that a lot of people can learn a lot from each other by living together for a long period of time or for a short period of time. <laughs> A lot of people are talking about how acid is supposed to uh, break down the gene structure and cause mutated children. And I was really hung up in that for a while because um, I really wanted to have nice whole kids. And I don't know, not anymore. I don't think that anymore because I talked to some people and they said that some people that know and they said that the serotonin that holds together the genes in the, in your chromosomes uh, broke down, but actually what it did was it brought out, it rearranged the genes so that uh, a recessive gene from way back in your past might come forward and be in your child. Like say your great, 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 great grandmother was mongoloid or something like that, and then you could have a chance for your child to be mongoloid. But I don't worry about that too much anymore. Well, I don't think I don't think that there's very much chance of, of, of the recessive gene theory being true. I believe that things run in good in good and negative fields. I believe it's a positive force and I don't think that the mutation would be for, for the bad. There's no question that a great deal of chromosome breakage and rearrangements can be found in the majority of LSD users as well as in babies that are exposed to the drug in their mother's womb during pregnancy. The, this damage appears to persist for at least several years. The only analogy that's well studied in man is the case of exposure to radiation. For example, the incidence of leukemia in the general population is about 1 in 6,000. But in individuals exposed to a lot of radiation, enough to give you the same kind of chromosome damage, is about 1 in 270. That's about a 20-fold increase. I would personally advise any young person not to take the drug at this particular time. Now, a lot of young kids walk around with a button that says, let's mutate. But it's a sad fact that well over 99% of all mutations in man are either very detrimental or downright lethal. I think it's just theory. If there is a mutation, I think it probably would be for the better. Because you, you look at the forces like around the world, the negative forces and the positive forces, and you look at who are the people that are taking acid and who, who are the people that aren't taking acid, and um, you see that the people that are taking acid at least are trying, are trying to salvage something out of the world before it blows up. This was done by the Indians for many, many thousands of years on this same ground, and it was quite all right. I mean, everything was quite attractive until Caucasoids moved in and tried to make profits. So I would say that what we're doing here is a kind of pilot study in one facet, if you will, of the life that is going to be in this country. Uh, we are also enlisting the aid of the University of California, uh, particularly the School of Architecture, to help design Morningstar. On it's amazing the diversity. Many, of course, are attracted to work in the garden. As I said, many are interested in constructing their own homes. And many, I think, 
need to, do, to learn to do nothing. That's something I'd like to learn how to do because it's possible to be enlightened in any kind of activity as a karma yogi. LSD is no doubt something that has entered the world as a facet of the divine and it should be used to reveal the divine. It's no accident that it entered the world at roughly the same time that nuclear fission did. And there's no doubt that anyone who denies himself the opportunity of the consciousness expansion that is available, perhaps it is pseudo, perhaps it is some kind of chemical substitute, but it is definitely a very accurate reproduction of the mystic transport that uh, St. Teresa, St. John of the Cross, everybody has written about. So I think if one denies themselves that particular adventure of consciousness in the 20th century, you're simply a fool. It's a mighty sound. 